jellyfish are often ignored. They are one of the sort of original predators. Can we film it? Yeah, we want to film that. So it's very exciting to see what we find. We have some good guesses, but uh, whether we will see those species, we will see. Anyone who has ever seen pictures or videos of jellies knows that they are super beautiful. They are extremely photogenic, and this is not what we normally get in the nets. So it's wonderful to be able to film them in situ using ROVs or submersibles and to see them in situ and also to collect specimens in good condition. It's a unique opportunity to see deep water jellies as they're supposed to be seen. My name is Aino Hosia and I studied jellyfish diversity and ecology. I moved to Bergen in Norway to do my PhD in 2003 and have been working with jellies ever since. There are two things that are challenging about studying jellies. One of them is sort of convincing people to actually also study the jellies because people always just want to study the crustaceans and the fish and then jellies are sort of forgotten. The other is they're very fragile. So using traditional nets is not the best method to study them because they will get squished in the nets and they will be broken to bits and pieces and you won't get a good idea of the diversity. Understanding biodiversity is key to protecting ecosystems because in the ecosystem everything is connected to everything. Without understanding what species there are, what roles they play, then you cannot really understand the entire ecosystem. And jellyfish are a component that are often ignored, even though they are very important for the system as major predators. They are one of the sort of original predators. So they're an extremely successful group that has been around since prehistoric times, I mean much longer than dinosaurs or sharks or other prehistoric animals that you would imagine. And they have been pretty much unchanged since then. They are very successful in what they do. The gelatinous fauna of the Norwegian Sea is actually not that well known. So it's very exciting to see what we find. We really don't know. We have some good guesses, but uh, whether we will see those species, we will see. It's an aglanta. It's a little uh, cracky medusa, a hydrosome jellyfish. So while we're here in Ocean X, we plan to do several different things. First of all, we're using the filming opportunities and the collection opportunities that we have with the ROV and the submersibles to collect these very fragile animals in good condition. Oh, that's nice. Oh, yeah. Because we've brought with us our net, so we can get net samples from the whole water column and see what's there. We can go through it physically and identify things morphologically and count them and see how many of each species there are. Then we are doing the vertical transects with the ROV where we can also identify the species visually and, and see where in the water column they are. And in, in addition, we're taking water samples with the CTD. Gelatinous zooplankton, it has a lot of different definitions. What we work with is gelatinous predators. So it's uh, gelatinous animals that feed on other zooplankton mostly. And that includes different kinds of jellyfish, both the large Skyphozoan jellyfish like the moon jelly and the lion's mane jelly. But most of the diversity is actually in a group called hydrozoans, which are very small jellyfish. Uh, in Norway, we have uh, more than 100 species of tiny jellyfish, and it also includes this very cool uh, colonial jellyfish called siphonophores. And most people may not be familiar with siphonophores, but most people know at least one siphonophore, even if they don't know that's what it is, and that's the Portuguese man o' war. And then it includes um, tinophores or com jellies. There might be some cool species because we have both the Arctic water and the Atlantic, yeah. so. You can have all the quill you want. <laughs>
we have been working on DNA barcoding the Norwegian fauna of uh, jellies. You use a short sequence of a specific gene, and this is a gene that is very good for separating different species. So if you if you sequence it and you look at the sequence and you group these, then you will be able to separate the species based on this gene. And we're building a reference library, sequence library, which allows identifying the animals just based on their genetics. Ooh, that's nice. I think we have most of the commonly occurring species of gelatinous soap plankton in Norwegian waters in our database. So we are lacking a few of the rare ones, which we hope that maybe we'll encounter here. The thing we're testing which is called eDNA, or environmental DNA. When animals are swimming around in water, they are all the time they are losing cells. Lots of jellies, we'll see. Thank you. <laughs> And then this DNA is in the water column. Just by taking a water sample and filtering all the DNA out of this and then sequencing the DNA that we filtered out, uh, you can get a sort of a list of species that are occurring in the area, theoretically. Yes. And there are some mice, it's like here floating, I think it's dead now. Yes. And some super large uh, copepods. Jellies, because they're so fragile, they're very often ignored in monitoring. That's why we would also like to have alternative methods for monitoring the diversity of gelatinous zooplankton because it is still a considerable portion of the total diversity of plankton. And of course they're predators, so they're ecologically very important. I think you can try with I both? I think it's in now. Yeah. Wow, it's a big, that's a big colony. During the past 20 years, it has been more and more accepted that jellies are a very important component of the marine ecosystems, both as predators and as prey. The previous view was that jellyfish are dead and they are not energetically good to eat because they are 99% water. But then again, jellies can be very large and that means that they can also be easy to find. So Still, if you find a single jelly, that can be a lot of food uh, compared to a tiny copepod. Also, jellyfish contain lots of different parasites. So it's actually like a concentrated buffet. It's not just a jellyfish, but it's everything else that lives within this jellyfish. So it might actually be very good food as well. And that's what we're finding out that jellyfish do form an important part of the diet of many animals, different species of fish, several seabirds, sea turtles. Nice. Oh, yeah. That was actually, I think it was probably Alocatictina. That's uh, not something that we often see. We're becoming more and more aware that we're destroying a lot of biodiversity, both terrestrial diversity and marine diversity. Jellies, they have been often ignored in monitoring. So that's a large part of the diversity that we know very little about. And if we know very little about, then we also can not see the changes in diversity. We don't know if we lose species or if the species composition changes because we don't sort of have a starting point to compare to. So oh, 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 it's a... Oh, oh, can you say this and stop? Can we oh film it? God. Yeah, we want to film that. Yeah. Oh, that is so cool. The oceans are by far the largest habitat on Earth, and we still know extremely little about them. Which is why the kind of ocean exploration that OceanX provides opportunities for is extremely important. 